So we will move on to the next panel uh, where we have most of our panelists online and I'm not sure if we can, yes, oh, I see everyone, thank you. So we are now going to focus on the user perspective a little bit more, uh, even if we have touched upon that in many, many times before. But this, uh, this session is about the lived accessibility, so how the uh, how the end users perceive things and uh, it doesn't really matter sometimes if it's compliant or not because it's really what you encounter as a user uh, that is important and here we have um, our introduction made by Kato Lie, uh, my dear friend from Norway and his uh, CV is so long that I can only mention a couple of his titles but he's the senior advisor at the Norwegian Federation of Organizations for People with Disabilities so the umbrella organization in Norway and also one member of the board of the EDF and then a long list of other things that he's doing. But today he has uh, promised to give us a little bit of an introduction from his view or the Norwegian view of uh, of the lived experience of uh, accessibility. Please, Katja. Thank you very much for your invitation and your kind words. Uh, so you said my name is Katja Lee. I was born with spinal bifida, spinal cord disorder, and I am a wheelchair user. I work as a senior advisor politically with universal design and accessibility in all areas of society. So also ICT in Norway. In addition, as you mentioned, I have several international commitments. Uh, I also want to mention that I'm president of the International Federation for Spina Bifida and Hydrocephalus. And as you said, board member of the European Disability Forum, which is co-organizing this event. FFO, the Norwegian Federation of Organizations of Disabled People, my employer, is an umbrella organization for 87 member organizations, representing almost 400,000 individuals with disabilities in Norway. Uh, and we know that in the Web Accessibility Directive, user involvement is a requir requirement. Member countries, supervisory authorities or monitoring agencies like the Digital Directorate in Norway must involve people with disabilities when they select which websites and apps are to be controlled. This is unfortunately not the case in Norway and they also have very limited resources as I heard about in the previous session. Public sector covered by the directive must publish and accessibility statement that describes their accessibility status. Most write very technically and only think about pleasing the regulator, but the report is also for people with disabilities to get an overview of any problems. This is of course very important. In addition, website owners must offer a feedback mechanism where visitors to the web or app can give feedback about things that don't work. This is a very important part of the directive, which when users are active and website owners are responsive, can have great positive effects. In general, user involvement is often forgotten also in Norway. To us, it is of the utmost essence that all user needs are taken into account when accessibility is discussed, planned and implemented, especially when it comes to digital accessibility, where for example, persons with physical disabilities are rarely involved or considered. Wheelchair users like myself are consulted when it comes to the built environment or transport, but seldom or not for user testing of ICT. But when your hands are busy with handling a wheelchair, you may, for example, choose to provide input to your digital device with your voice. Rheumatic diseases, which often makes users defer to assistive technology rather than mainstream keyboards, affect more than 40% of Europe, Europe's population. This is just one example of how important an often forgotten user group is. For the implementation of the Web Accessibility Directive to be successful, role and user participation is a key issue. In Norway, we use the term universal design in the legislation, but in reality, the technical requirements are often focused on accessibility. Without going in depth with the eternal discussion around these themes like design for all, inclusive design, etc., it's important to state that for us, the concept of universal design, whatever you choose to call it, must be the end goal. It's not just about ramps, so technical accessibility, but also dignity, 
participation in society, independence, and so on. Interestingly enough, the next EU directive, the European Accessibility Act, that enters into force in 2025 speaks about maximizing the foreseeable use of certain products and services. This is, at least on paper, a very appealing approach. But unfortunately, this act will not cover building, uh, buildings and transport. That is regrettable. That's another matter. Involving users with different disabilities when designing and developing digital services is the only way to ensure accessibility and usability for all users. It is also the only way to really monitor accessibility in websites and apps. It is time for public sector bodies, ICT suppliers, and monitoring agencies to acknowledge the expertise end users provide and involve them in all stages of development process from needs and requirements to testing and monitoring. Finally, I want to give you an excellent example in Norway where user involvement resulted in a product used by many Norwegians every day called VIPS. It is an app where you can transfer money very easily. Before, blind people could not use VIPS, but after contacting relevant user organizations and involving, involving users, VIPS won the Norwegian Innovation Award for Universal Design in 2020. So in conclusion, Treat end users as the experts they are, compensate them accordingly, and make sure to cover all users' needs, broadly grouped as motor, speech, cognition, hearing, and visual impairments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Kato. It was a very good introduction to this um, to this panel, and I want to say welcome to our panelists. Now we have uh, four of you online and one in the room, so we are doing different setups every every um, every panel here. So we have uh, Sara Shellstrand, uh, who is a senior expert in cognitive accessibility, uh, with us from Sweden, and we have another Swede here beside me, Sara Jadin, another Sarah, uh, who is a digital communications officer at the Swedish National Association for Dyslexia. And we have online uh, uh, Mikael Duren, who is a senior expert in accessibility auditing and user testing at Fenning Parade in Germany. Very interesting uh, organization that I just learned more about, uh, doing many, many interesting things. And then from Finland, we have Timo Övermark, who is the lead UX and accessibility specialist at Q Factory. And he's also a certified web accessibility specialist. So been doing accessibility work for, for many years. So we have many different um, perspectives here, user organizations, end users, and experts in different, different aspects of the end user perspective. So I wanted to start with asking about the gap between the minimum requirements and what many of us consider as real accessibility or usability for, for end users. So how can we bridge that gap or how do we make sure that that the accessibility provided by in this case public sector bodies are actually meeting not only the legal requirements but also the real actual user needs so i want to start with maybe sarah what's your what's your say oh sorry sorry shell stand <laughs> in sweden uh to, this was bad i shouldn't have two people with the same name in the same panel bad planning sarah shell stand please <laughs> Uh, okay, thank you. Then I would like to tweak the, the question, because uh, when I think about minimum requirements, of course, I think about the legislation as it is. And then from my perspective of having researched needs in cognitive accessibility, the minimum requirements in the legislation do not um, currently cover all the different needs. So, I mean, there are people who say that you could never actually have minimum requirements in a standard or legislation that will cover everything. There will always be a need for additional measures, but a good start would be to actually review, think about the requirements that we have and see if they actually cover the, um, the bare minimum of needs also for groups that were not in the focus when the legislation and when the requirements span the legislation were developed quite a while ago. So there are a lot of common needs on the cognitive side that I think could be added to the minimum requirements, and that would already be a step towards 
um, more accessibility for larger groups. Okay, thank you very much. So I'll then ask the second Sara <laughs> here in the room with me from the dyslexia organization. Um, what's your what's your take on this? How could we bridge the gap? Yeah, uh, I think we have to um, focus a little bit more on standardization um, and also on understandability. Because, I mean, it's one thing to access something, but you also have to understand it. And, and if you do have some communicative problem or, or cognitive problem, that will be the, the big uh, problem. Uh, and I think we as a society produce more and more information, which is totally the wrong way to go. <laughs> we need to minimize and try to focus what do we want to say. And it's so hopeless if, if, you, if you don't understand something. And what you get is a long, long, long text. I mean, what, what are people to do? It's, it's, um, uh, and also uh, less information and, and also more standardized where if, if, if you're looking for a menu or something, you don't want uh, a service to have a new way to present a menu. You want to have the menu on the same place. It's so, so, so important. And, and also if you look for, for a summarization, you want it to be on the in the same place. Because it, it, if, if you do have problem reading, uh, it will take so much effort to read something. And, and you then don't want to, to spend a lot of time on, on, on doing a meaningless just skimming to find the right information or find the right place. You want to have the information where it should be. So that's something we have to concentrate on. And let the users kind of recognize the same patterns so that it's easier yeah. to find. So that's a good point. So Mikael, in your, in your view, what can we do uh, to bridge the gap between the requirements and the actual user needs? Yeah, thanks, Susanna. It's a good question. Um, in our daily work, we have achieved the best results with explanation. So we explain with simple examples what is the difference between conformity and usability. So best example is you need 200 tap steps to reach the button, I will buy something, we'll get in feedback something else. This explains in the best way, yes, it fits the conformity, but it doesn't fit the user needs. So same is... Um, our customers understand that the goal of an evaluation should be usability. And we have the advantage on our side that with our institution for people with disabilities, we have a position for ourselves here that we can reject orders that are purely aimed at conformity. So we can talk about usability, the user accessibility needs with all the examples the other panelists have uh, explained. Thank you. That's very interesting. So go, let's go to Finland. Timo, uh, are you so tough that you say no to clients who don't, who just want to do conformance uh, reports? Uh, yeah, we haven't reached that that point yet. But uh, because a uh, lot of times when you set a level for minimum conformance, then that becomes the maximum. And of course, that's not what we want, but uh, actually the minimum requirements are quite good in that they eliminate most severe problems, but they don't uh, transcend that quite easily. So they remove all the major obstacles that a user might have when using a service that, uh, for example, a piece of information cannot be um, perceived or understood or a functionality cannot be used. Those are eliminated, but then that's the starting point for uh, starting to improve usability because, uh, uh, and it should be viewed that way that it's only the minimum. And uh, because um, the real world usability is not like a conforming or not conforming question, it's not binary, but uh, these requirements are, and that's, they're meant to be such, such because uh, 
they need to be easy to evaluate they need to be um, when different people are evaluating the guidelines then they much uh, must reach the same conclusions when evaluating so um, that's the way they are but real world accessibility is not an either or thing um, it might be especially if you uh, start to go in the field of usability so something might be difficult to use and that's why it um, the information is never gotten or you cannot use a service because it's difficult or people don't know how to uh, use their assistive devices so that they can actually uh, reach that uh, functionality or piece of information and uh, especially for people with cognitive impairments then uh, that becomes mostly usability related issues and uh, those are not easily transformed into guidelines and either or three things and i think that's the main problem like uh what what's the level that you need to achieve or what's the level of ease of use for example that's really difficult to find because it's different thing for different users a uh, different uh, level for different kinds of services uh, depends on the target group and so forth so it's not easy but anyway i think um we should also require or at least try to uh, get different organizations to focus on usability and uh, try to get the message across that usability is important and that the minimum requirement is not sufficient. We need to do something more to actually make, make the content usable and accessible for uh, people with different needs. Yes, thank you. I think the, um, I, I agree with Kato, we shouldn't uh, dwell into the uh, terminology thing here, but but I think we tend to see it a little bit different. I think we, we see accessibility as a bit broader than that, and I would argue that cognitive accessibility is not always the same thing as usability, but actually still in the kind of core of accessibility, but that's, that's a longer discussion, I think, and, and really needs to be defined in many ways. So, Kato, just from the motor impaired perspective, um, what do you, how do you see the the kind of the gap between the user requirements and the and the the legal requirements and the actual user needs? Hmm. Yes, well, uh, I want to paint a little bit the big big picture because, as I said in my in my speech, um, I'm usually involved in in uh, projects, uh, building buildings and transport and those areas and not involved in ICT projects. And uh, we see also in the built environment and transport means that uh, minimum uh, requirements are the ones that are being met. We also see that in ICT. And I think we have to work together uh, very hard to improve, uh, for example, the web accessibility directive to make it stronger so that it meets the needs for, for the people it's meant to uh, meet the needs for. And uh, to, to be able to do that, I think uh, the IAAP and the EDF and also national organizations have to work together to improve what's actually the current minimum uh, requirements so that the minimum requirements are raised on a higher level. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, that was very kind of solution oriented. So is there another way we can make sure that the needs of all user groups are taken into account I mean, uh, if if we wanted to do user testing for everything, that would be extremely costly and, and time consuming. So how is there another way of doing that? Sarah, you talked about standards before, but but is there another, I mean, how can we make sure that we have this broad understanding, even though the standards today are a little bit lacking some of the some of the user needs? Oh, <laughs> that's a tricky question, I guess. Um, um, I don't know. Really. <laughs> <laughs> well, make the standards better, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and I, I mean, I know that standards are really super uh, important for our groups because it means that everything in the future will get better. Uh, and and if you if you get people to follow a standard, it's it will be easier for everyone. So. 
But you mentioned yeah. yesterday, for example, when we discussed the the um, uh, feedback mechanisms that mm -hmm. that that your user groups were so frustrated because all the feedback mechanism required them to to write, and that is, I think, yeah. it's just a sign of that because of the uh, requirements look like they do, mm -hmm. uh, the other user groups tend to be forgotten. So I think we are pushing in a direction where we tend to exclude some users by yeah. not intentionally but, mm -hmm. but because the standards look as they do we, yeah. we kind of focus in one direction and then we tend to forget the other yeah and, and i mean society is very text-based yeah. and and uh, uh, especially for 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 groups with people who who where the language is the main barrier i mean it, the you you come to to a, a form of some kind and you are expected to to write there isn't any 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 other way of of, of giving your feedback mm. and what do you do yeah you just don't care and don't give any feedback i mean why should you uh, and and i think for these people you have to have this kind of meet and greets or or workshop and small workshop where you really uh, get to to know these people because uh, the feedback for them are, are, are something, if you don't understand something, how can you give feedback on it? Mm -hmm. it's, it's really time consuming and you have to sit down with people to really understand why is this hard? I mean, it's just to say, I don't like this. It will be the first answer probably. But why? That's uh, that's something that takes time. Yeah. So, Mikael, how do you how do you think that we can make sure to cover all all user needs um, in development processes and design processes? Do you have a, a good a good clue more than involving users? <laughs> ah, question with a very complex answer. Um, we know that there is no universal solution for all user groups, at least for more complex digital objects. From my expert point of view, two things are crucial to develop good digital objects. First, all roles involved in the development process need a knowledge base of accessibility. And second, people with disabilities should be involved in the evaluation of the digital object as early as possible. So that that may be fit in digital products in the digital world that fit for many users with accessibility needs overall. Okay, thank you. And Sarah Shellstrand, um, how do you think we can make sure that the needs of all user groups are taken into account in development? What's the what's your solution? It's there? Extremely complex question with a lot of different angles and and answers. And I, I still believe in awareness raising. When I talk to people who gone into accessibility, especially from the developer side. It's like, yay, I met this person who had this and that disability and those and those needs, and then and I understood it. But the thing is that then you usually just see one user group and their specific issues. And there are organizations working like that with accessibility from one specific group. And it's really good um, in one way, because then you actually can get deep into those kind of needs. but it also um, can lead to like everybody working in their own silo. So I think there is a need for more awareness raising about how many different needs there actually are. And I was thinking about this, especially um, around the, the discussion or non-discussion around universal design, um, what we actually call things, because with the European Accessibility Act, the um, uh, sort of language is much more towards the widest range of users and a bit broader than just specific requirements. Like the, the word is much more um, emphasis on specific types of accessibility for specific groups. I'm wondering if the language will actually also have a, a change of mindset or if it will be everybody is still sort of socialized in their own environment to have their own vocabulary and will still work with accessibility in the way they're used to. But I would say that uh, awareness raising on accessibility as being very broad and, and a large range of 
needs also for persons uh, without disabilities that is still needed. Okay, thank you very much. So Timo, from your um, viewpoint as an, as an expert and um, supporting your clients, how do you, how do you make sure that your clients are taking, uh, taking all user needs into account when you work with them, when you support them on developing things? Yeah, I agree that uh, awareness raising is really important. And that's also the main thing, I think, in client work in a way, because, uh, of course, everyone thinks that uh, design should always be focused on user needs and be based on real users. And that's the aim, mostly. But uh, a lot of people don't have experience on accessibility and uh, especially designers and developers, because uh, I think most accessibility issues are created when uh, designing and developing services and creating content uh, into the service. Uh, and uh, that's also where it needs to be solved. So it's about uh, the professional know-how of the individuals that they actually know um, about accessibility. They know um, the best practices. They know the guidelines, what they need to do. and uh, also uh, making uh, the best practices more uh, more mainstream and um, we need to raise awareness like um, we need to teach and uh, educate designers developers and uh, content creators on accessibility so that's i think that's the one of one of the things and um, another thing is that uh, we also need to make sure that the organization uh, thinks that accessibility is actually important and a thing that they should invest into. And that's that's the other side of things, that uh, accessibility is not always considered important for the organization. Uh, they, of course, regulation is, is a good thing. And uh, of course, we're today uh, sitting in, a, uh, in an event uh, focused around uh, regulation. And when I think about the work that I've been doing in the in the previous uh, 15 years related to accessibility, uh, regulation has done really a lot and uh, has improved accessibility awareness a lot around Europe. And that's a good thing. And uh, we can um, all agree that the minimum requirements are perhaps not enough, but anyway, it has uh, brought accessibility into the uh, into uh, a lot of organizations by requiring some level of accessibility. And then we are gradually starting to see that uh, the organizations that have been doing, for example, accessibility audits and the bare minimum and focusing really hard on the, the details and the individual guidelines, uh, they are slowly starting to uh, evolve into a more uh, proactive way of looking at accessibility. And I think uh, the user-centered way is also part of that. So, and should be that uh, they are first and foremost thinking about the user and thinking about the user experience and not too much focusing on the details of the guidelines because uh, the guidelines will be met and the minimum requirements will be met if you design, design and develop and deliver the service uh, in a good user-focused and user-centered way. So that's 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 one major thing also that uh, making the organizations realize that access, accessibility is actually uh, it's about quality of the service and uh, it's really important thing uh, also not only for people with accessibility needs but for the broad public also it makes the service better and easier to use and uh, better experience for everyone. Okay, thank you. So, Kato, you almost uh, responded already in your in your last response, but I'll let you have a go as well. So, so how how do we make sure that the user needs? You said that the stakeholders are going to work together. So that's yeah. Um, I think Timo had a lot of uh, the remarks uh, I had planned to make, but uh, I think we have to stress uh, the importance of user participation or involvement uh, to being the key to develop better products like websites and apps. Uh, in Norway, this is form formalized by regulations, uh, which is of course important, uh, but still often forgotten when the developers actually do their work. So I think developers have to be educated, which is a really key issue. 
but also one tool or one way to go could be by showing best practices, examples like VIPs that I talked about earlier, uh, shows that uh, you achieve better results when end users are involved in, in diff the different uh, developing projects. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kata. I think I think it's a very good example, uh, Vips, but I don't know if it's a best practice because they first released it without user testing and then they did it. So that's a little bit backwards to me, but, <laughs> but yeah, it's a good but, example that proves that it became better. So in that case, it's a it's a good good example. Yeah, yeah. they learned along the way, and that's a good thing. That's also well, a, that's, way, a way to achieve the end, a good end result. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that's true. So I'll uh, just see if there's anyone in the room who has a question. For the audience before we go to the to the last bit i have we have one question online which is a long one uh, understandability as a word is present in many paragraphs of the uh, uh which one is this i think this is the 19 it must be the european accessibility act uh, but seems there is no requirement but we can to evaluate its conformance which is very far from user needs. How can we set something objective, a measurable for understandable quotes? Can we consider on other ISO standards rather than WCAG? Do we have only user tests to evaluate it? Sorry if I misread that. So I think Sarah Shelstrand, maybe you have an idea of, of how to define understandability or how to work towards something that could define understandability at least. Um, I yeah, it's a big, big question. But I mean, what I usually say is that there is uh, a need for research and a need to research common user needs in cognitive accessibility and understandability is really a big part of it. And there are quite a lot of recommendations and standards um, that do include good practices or resources for understandability. Um, and a lot of them could also be made measurable and actually go into the, the legislation. So far, it doesn't hasn't really happened. Um, but I understand, and Susanna, you know that better than me, that uh, standardization processes are already and still going on in the European scene. So there is still hope for getting more cognitive requirements into the minimum requirements and the standards. Um, and that would include understandability absolutely and and i want to state again what detlef said earlier that there is a gitlab uh, channel for anyone who wants to contribute to the to the en and as we have now opened it for a review for the accessibility act we have also possibilities to add new things to the standard so that's absolutely a, a good way uh, sarah do you want to sarah from the dyslexia organization do you want to say something about understandability as yes well? i do uh, there's actually uh, an ic ISO uh, standard from this summer uh, about understandability. And uh, Esther Hedberg from my organization, she has been one of the people who, who has worked on it. And it's, it's based on, on a, a project about understandability that we did earlier. It ended in 2019. And we actually sat down with people then and asks what is what is not good with this text? Why is this not good, or why is this good? And and it took, of course, a long time, but uh, we got good results, and and some of these results uh, are the base for this standard. Then, so, and this is a standard that is you need to pay for it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. We can share the yeah. link, but we cannot yeah. share the standard. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, Mikael. Did you want to say something about understandability as well? Did you have any? Um, it's a good question. Um, understandability uh, is part of accessibility. It's necessary. Um, we are talking about disabled people. Um, I mostly talk about impaired and disabled people. So we have the needs of all the people living in, in a country like Germany with which mother language is not Germany. So we have to explain, we have the same questions uh, like cognitive problems. I think we have together, all together in Europe, a big point. It's getting the elderly people. I'm getting 60 in some years, so I'm working on a world 
that the world after retirement from work is more accessible for me. Germany especially is working in the government in the whole digitalization of all processes to the to the people. So and they are not working hard enough on the accessibility questions. We have the problems. Pure accessibility reach something and mostly the understandability of what can I reach? Can I take the action which requires such a digital process? So I think yes, it's it's, it's a big point. We have we have a have a very close look on this so we don't do not lost people in the digital world so everybody knows the the people in the moment uh, have to switch uh, to online banking but mm -hmm. it's not usable for people more than 80 they do not have any idea what is a digital assistant what is a smartphone they know how to call somebody but not about the complex questions you have a website for registration, you get an app, you get an app code. Maybe you have a second app for a ton for authentication, something like this. I think there are a lot of questions we have to talk about in the context of understanding the digital world and the problems of this we, we bring to the people. Thanks. Yeah, it's sometimes that technology will bring more problems than solutions. But uh, Timo or Kato, did any one of you want to chime in on the understandability? Really, the question was uh, about the kind of um, measurability of understandability. So how difficult it may be to know what is understandable or not if we're going to make it into a standard or a law. Well, I have no real comments on that. Uh, I think it's been covered. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So another question from the audience is, uh, how do we select disability groups when selecting users for research? So I'd, and um, I'll give that to you as well, Sarah, from Dyslexia. Yeah, Yeah. I, I think as been said before, we, we, we have to look at, at the people as a broader group. I mean, they have just as many uh, possibilities and problems as anybody else. And, and uh, I think that uh, to, to think of, well, he's, he's disabled or blah, blah, blah. Uh, then you think of one person, but, but you have to see that, that it's a variety of, of, of uh, problems. And, and uh, uh, also, uh, Especially with cognitive problems, there is more of, uh, I mean, likes and dislikes, and and then there will be. There are so many factors that that can make. We when we had a uh, when we had groups that that they show that well one person he said well i can't I, I i can't read a text if i see a link in it or i can't read a text if there is a, a film there i mean the film it 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 will require me to to look at the film but i don't want to so so it's it's a feeling that that i have to do this but i don't want to and and then other people say I just want want the text from the film. Don't give me the film. I just give me the text. And so, I mean, there are so many needs and so many uh, uh, solutions too. So yeah. So I'll go to the other Sara then, Shellstrand. How do we select user groups for the research? That's one of your topics doing research. So yeah, uh, it's. Uh, it's always very complex, and I would say that it depends on the situation and what you are going to to do. And I think the main issue is to start early and don't do as with VIPs and remember afterwards to to do testing. Yes, start early and think about all the different kinds of uses, um, perhaps uses rather than users and different ranges, and then start to look at what kind of needs before you look at groups, because if you start with groups, then you quickly become uh, bewildered with how many different user groups there are. And this organization does that, but not that. And the other does this and not that. But if you look at what your, your um, end product or what you're researching is going to achieve and take it from the different user needs, then you can start looking at the groups. That's what I would say. 
Okay, thank you. Timo, do you have a, a view on this, doing a user research? How do you select your groups? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Uh, usually because um, the web is mostly based on visual layout and uh, visual uh, information, then of course, uh, uh, someone with uh, visual impairments is probably someone who you want to test with. And that's that's uh, probably the most, most common thing related to accessibility and most common user group that is already covered quite well in accessibility. But I would also uh, emphasize uh, the cognitive side and uh, someone someone from that group is is important to have we actually have started to uh, develop uh, like a user uh, resource uh, or like a pool of users to to make uh, testing easier for organizations and this is one of the main questions that uh, how do we actually uh, categorize people uh, do we need to categorize people or do we just uh, uh, because any user testing is always beneficial anyway, and we get really good findings, but uh, we should somehow try to uh, cover as much as possible with, uh, uh, so that we don't, uh, we don't have to have like 20 people participating in the, in the testing. So we try to achieve like uh, maybe uh, as diverse group as possible and different types of disabilities is, is a good uh, starting point. Okay, thank you. So we need to wrap up, but I will ask Carter to give us the last words on the way to our little coffee break. So we know we, we are agreeing, it seems like that it's important to involve users, uh, but we also know that uh, users are not enough involved. So how can we solve that? What is the golden uh, solution here from <laughs> from you. You have one minute to solve the problem. I'm sorry. Okay, that, that's easy. Uh, well, the problem we see is that there's a lack of knowledge on how to contact users uh, in design and development of digital services. But uh, FFO as an umbrella organization plays an important role, and also the DPOs, to, to uh, let's say, um, find the right users who can participate in in, in certain projects. So uh, th that's the role of the DPOs and the umbrellas to find the right people. We can help uh, the developers to find these people. So that would be very good. That, that, is, that is a good commitment from Norway. Thank you for that. So we'll, we'll have the whole of Europe calling you when they need a user. And if you can no, <laughs> provide no worries. it. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also a, a group of users in Finland. So that's good. We At least we have two points of contact we can make. That's very good. <clears throat> Sorry. So thank you very much for this. Now we have a 15 minute uh, coffee break, everyone. And I see more questions. We'll try to respond to them in writing. Thank you. <laughs>